Thanks. It's really a delight to be here at Moses Brown today. I can still remember the day, May 24, 1974, when I sat across the desk of the chair of the Department of Anthropology at Brown University, and he told me I wasn't getting tenure. Another year and I would be out of a job. He measured his words very carefully when I asked him what the reason was. He said my teaching was poor, but not so much worse than others. He said that the article I had just published in Woman, Culture, and Society, a new collection, had revealed an extremely weak theoretical orientation. Well, I was shocked. I had thought that my publication record was at least as good as the six men who made this decision. And besides, I thought they were my colleagues and my friends. I just said this couldn't possibly be happening to me. I thought I'd always played by the rules. I was editor of my school newspaper when I was in high school. I went to Stanford. I got a PhD at Harvard. I just didn't know how to respond. I think a man would have felt angry, having a real sense of injustice. But as a woman, my anger was tinged with a lot of self-doubt. I thought, maybe he's right. Maybe I'm really not good enough. Still, I felt I had to do something. I had just spended, spent too much time investing in my career and in my identity as an anthropologist. So I left the room still shaken, but with a little bit more determination. And I spent the next two weeks going to the top administrators at Brown, trying to find someone that would reverse the decision. I talked to the top ad women administrator, and she said her hands were tied. I tried to get the president. I tried to get the provost. Neither one would answer me. I felt like I was knocking on doors, and nobody would respond. I just felt there was no place I could go within the university. And so, two weeks later, I went to our graduation, and I talked to the chair and said I'd like to see him privately in his office. Inside, I told him I'd hired a lawyer. I was going to sue. There's an old saying, the squeaky wheel is what gets the grease. Well, I often think of a squeaky wheel not as just some complainer who wants something just for herself, but as somebody who's seen something in the system that needs fixing, that needs a little grease to make the system work better. Well, this was my squeaky wheel moment. This decision propelled me on a trajectory that led to a nationally known Title VII sex discrimination suit against Brown University. It was called Lamphere versus Brown. Well, when I first came to Brown in 1968, it was a much different place than it is today. Then there were only 25 women on the faculty, and 12 of them were tenured. I was the first woman who was an assistant professor on a tenure track in the sociology and anthropology department. And then when our department became independent in 1971, I was still the only woman assistant professor. There I am with the men in suits. But Brown is already changing when I got there. They developed a new curriculum in 1969. Pembroke and Brown merged in 71. And there was a growing movement against the Vietnam War that brought about a strike in May 1970. Stayed Sales Hall, which you saw there, turned into a strike center. And about the same time, women involved in the anti-war movement began to be interested in the growing feminist movement. We joined consciousness raising groups, we fought for abortion rights, and we protested against the University Club. This is a club in downtown Providence where administrators and male faculty got together for lunch, talked about university business, but no women were allowed to be members. Many of us wanted to bring our newfound interest in women into our classes. So I started a course called Women in Cross-Cultural Perspectives that I taught in 71 and 72. And then I got together with Michelle Rosaldo from Stanford University, and we put together this collection, Woman, Culture, and Society. It became a kind of academic bestseller. We sold over 75,000 copies. 
And of course, it was in this book that my theoretically weak article appeared. While I was pursuing my case, I also got a job at the University of New Mexico, and I soon got tenure. And then I went on to begin to do more research on women. This is my book on Central Falls, from working daughters to working mothers. But I really spent the next three years in a struggle with Brown University's lawyers. The first thing was an internal grievance procedure that went on for a year. It resulted in a kind of pro forma decision by the top administration. They looked over the department's decision and ratified it again. So I didn't get tenure still. In the meantime, Milton Stanzler, my lawyer, and Jordan Stanzler, his nephew, helped me to file a class action uh, lawsuit under the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. It alleged that I'd been discriminated against, but it also alleged that Brown had put in place a pattern and practice of discrimination by sex against all women faculty at Brown. We were lucky enough to get Raymond Jake Bettine as our lawyer, as our judge. He was a federal judge here in Providence who really took seriously the whole idea of sex discrimination. And then we got a second lucky break. During a deposition with my chair, the university lawyers handed over to us what we used to call the smoking gun, a series of letters between the chair and a senior male colleague. I can remember sitting in a small office over lunch in the university lawyer's firm. My colleague, Sue Benson, a historian, and I were poring over these letters under the watchful eye of a law clerk from the university's firm. And we were shocked at what we found. We kept whispering to each other, did you really see that? Do you really this? The letters clearly showed that my colleagues had colluded to get rid of me. They had pressured graduate students to write negative letters. But more importantly, rather than an objective assessment of my work, they had really been ruled by a dislike for feminist research in anthropology. But then we got a third lucky break. Brown changed uh, its president. The new president, Howard Swearer, felt that the case was really costing the university much too much money and was ruining Brown's reputation. So he began to feel it was important to do a settlement. And so, in the fall, I'm going to flip to the next one. Uh, in the fall of, two, of 1977, I signed a consent decree with Brown University. The consent decree awarded me tenure, but it also set up an affirmative action monitoring committee. It put in place new procedures, and it also put in place some goals and timetables. In other words, Brown, by signing the consent decree, agreed to hire 100 women and tenure 57 of them by 1987. We used to call it 57 by 87. So it was really the consent decree that changed this from a personal grievance into an instrument for transforming Brown. By the time the decree was settled in 1992, Brown had reached its goals and it had put in place permanently these new procedures. So Brown became a much different place. Today, there are 227 women on the faculty. That's 30% of the faculty. 134 of these women are tenured. The anthropology department now has nine women and eight men. And we have a woman chair in the anthropology department. Ruth Simmons has just finished 11 years as being the first African-American and first woman president. And just recently, the Brown Corporation chose Christina Paxson as its second woman president. In 1986, I went back to the University of New Mexico. I continued to publish. I've published eight books and collections. I've been president of the American Anthropological Association. But the most important thing I did in my life was to sue Brown University. And I learned two things from that. First, I learned that it's possible for an individual to really transform an institution and create the kind of change that's really very lasting. 
course, my case wasn't the only thing that changed Brown. Uh, there were social changes, a strong feminist movement, more women who got PhDs in the humanities, social sciences, and even the sciences, and of course, a growing momentum for affirmative action. Without these changes, Brown wouldn't have changed as well. However, there are still now social movements that new squeaky wheels can use to do this kind of inst institutional change. The second thing I learned was much more personal and had to do with my position as a woman in American society. During all those years, I still felt many of those same insecurities. I can remember talking to my friends, sometimes across the dinner table, and would reiterate the same things. Oh, maybe my teaching is poor. Maybe my research is theoretically weak. And they would talk back across the table at me and say, no, much to the contrary. They would encourage me and restore my confidence. I've always thought that our generation would be strong professional role models for our daughters, for our students, for people of your generation. But I've been really struck over the last decade or so about how many young women feel the same insecurities that I felt. When that happened to me, I realized that I had to reach into myself. I had to recount to myself the things that I'd really done that were good. And I had to be clear about the goal that I was trying to reach. In other words, I had to learn to trust myself. Everyone needs close friends, colleagues, supportive teachers to build a network of people who can shore up one's confidence. You need to have this network so you will steal the little bird that's sitting on top of your shoulder, whispering in your ear and saying, hmm, you're not good enough. So you really need that support network. Times have changed. But we still need squeaky wheels. We still need men and women to help work to transform institutions. But to do this transformational work, we have to trust ourselves. And we need that supportive network of mentors, partners, and friends who will banish those negative messages and help us to really fight injustice and work for real change. Thanks very much. <laughs>